All right. Hi, Raj. How are you doing? Good. Welcome to New York. Thanks. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. So um, I think uh, one of my colleagues, I wanted to kick this off because one of my colleagues I saw a video, he's not here right now, but uh, of him having fun in one of your latest vehicles in the, uh, the new 2017 Ford GT. <laughs> yeah. He got to take it around the track. Uh, is that, is that kind of your baby, that car? Or can you tell us a bit about that car? Yeah, that, that car is a, a little bit my baby, kind of, the, uh, kind of the opposite of an autonomous vehicle. Right. It <laughs> um, very much is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's very much a driver's car. We did that to celebrate our uh, win at the 24 Hours of Le Mans right. back in 1966. So it was the 50th anniversary of that last year, and we built that car and took it back to Le Mans to race last year and won again on nice. the 50th birthday. So that car is a little bit of a celebration for us. So Great. Obviously a very fun car to drive. Yeah. So hopefully you had a good time. Yeah, he had a great time. He was, uh, yeah, he was very exuberant about, about his experience there. I think uh, it's interesting, though, that you led with that, that like, this is the opposite of a self-driving car, an autonomous car. So I think one of the questions is, uh, when you see those cars, and you answered a bit, like, why, why do you build that car, right? It's a, what is it, a $400,000, $500,000 vehicle? Starts at four fifty. Right. So, you know, it's not within reach. There are 250 of them or something? Or? 250 a year, so a four year. years, or so a total of 1,000. Right, and that's not something people are going to be picking up and driving. Um, and it's also, it has really nothing to do with autonomy, or does it have, are there implications in the technology when you're building a vehicle like that that will bear out with self-driving? Well, I mean, the car has a lot to do with technology. Um, you know, it's all carbon fiber construction, and that's going to be, important as we bring more and more carbon fiber to reduce the weight of the vehicles. Um, very advanced aerodynamics and active aerodynamics, so that'll also be coming in to improve fuel efficiency. It's got our EcoBoost technology, which is um, direct injection and port injection and turbocharging combined in a proprietary way, so it's making, out of a 3.5 liter V6, it's making almost 650 horsepower. So uh -huh. that level of efficiency will all be important um, going forward, but autonomy, no, it's, it's really about driving the vehicle, and it's one of the interesting things about um, the automotive industry, it's obviously, um, you know, a, a product that is usually the second most expensive thing people buy. Yeah. Um, it's a product that's extremely critical relative to safety requirements, it's, um, you know, certainly when things go wrong, they can go very wrong. Yeah. Um, it's a product that's pretty technically complex. Yes. Already in our current vehicles, we've got more lines of code than a Boeing 777. Oh, wow. Um, we also build at really big scale. So these are multi-billion dollar investments for each one, and we build hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of some of the vehicles a year. So literally, you know, every 45 seconds, another F-150 is coming off the line and being sold. Yet. For most people, it's also an emotional buy. Right. Um, you're buying a new vehicle in particular that says something about yourself, whether it's an off-road vehicle or a Mustang or, or, or a hybrid or whatever. And certainly the GT says something to people's emotions. So it's very much an emotional buy. And even though we're only building 1,000 of them, we've got uh, 6,500 applications for those vehicles. Oh, wow. OK. And how are you going to winnow down? Who um, we're actually looking for people who are, are going to drive them. So certainly Ford loyalists, Ford fans, people who have a lot of Fords right now, but we don't want them to be museum pieces. We want them out on the road. We want them out on the track. And we want people to see them and enjoy them. We, we didn't engineer it to, to sit in a museum. Right. Uh, we engineered it to, to enjoy driving them, uh, whether on the road or the track. So hopefully we'll be seeing more and more out there. Great. Um, I think just this is kind of speculative, but do you think there'll be a 100th anniversary GT. Like, at that time, I know that now there's, that's still a very core part of people's thinking about automobiles. Is like, it's, a, it's an identity piece, it's passion, uh, it's freedom. But, you know, 50 years out, is there enough of a market to sell 1,000 of those things? <laughs> or like, I, I'm serious, like, will yeah. people care enough anymore? Or will they eventually? Well, I mean, certainly the technology is progressing very fast. Yeah. Um, you know, we at Ford, we're 114 years old. Um, so there's aspects of the start of the automotive industry and um, what it meant for personal mobility. Um, and certainly horses don't serve the role that they used to, right. but there's still a lot of horse races that are a big deal. Are, um, yeah, yeah. And people still enjoy uh, riding horses. I hope it doesn't go that far. 
um, where we're years at right from now. now, but you know, it's certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. I think there will always be an aspect of um, there's something about you know controlling a piece of machinery. Um, you're talking about you know two thousand, three thousand pounds of uh, machinery being controlled by very minute movements of your hand and small movements of your ankle and small brake pressures, yet incredible forces and, and G's and horsepower all being done by that and taking yourself to the limit and taking the machine to the limit, there's something in our brains that are wired to enjoy that. So hopefully that's always part of it. Well, as, like, as you were speaking there, you speak very poetically about it. And I, I, was, I was following along. I was right there with you. So you're probably right about that. <laughs> but uh, So you've been at Ford for quite a while now, right? When, when did you start at Ford? 1987. Yeah. Oh, OK. So you've seen a lot of changes over the time. And you've been CTO since 2012, is that right? Yeah, or? five years. OK. So even in that time, a lot of changes. Sure. Um, I guess like maybe just sort of. Uh, uh, how, how has your role changed, both as an engineer and then as CTO, in that time? You know, when did kind of the shift happen where you start thinking about things like mobility services and autonomy, and, and what does that journey look like, I guess, over time? Yeah, I mean, certainly over the 30-year period, um, you know, a lot of my experience, a lot of engineering experience in Ford was very traditional automotive focused, mm -hmm. and whether it's on the engine side or the powertrain side or the chassis side or bodies, et cetera. And still very high tech, right? It, it's still, you know, like I said, even in a traditional vehicle, the amount of software we have. Um, but with the advent of, of some of the technologies, whether it be the infotainment systems, the connectivity of the vehicle, now the vehicle is becoming a device on the Internet of Things, increased electrification, whether it's hybrids or plug-in hybrids or battery electric vehicles, and certainly the autonomous vehicle technology. And then also on, on the external environment, the, the increasing pressure on, um, on emissions and fuel economy uh, to reduce our green ga greenhouse gas footprint, um, increasing congestion in the cities, uh, increased middle class, the emerging markets, all of that kind of culminating and all hitting a peak at the same time. Um, I wouldn't say any of these was happening overnight. I mean, we've been working on autonomous vehicles for, for 12 years now. Right. Um, but the timing of an autonomous vehicle, the timing of the importance of electrification, the timing of reducing our, our greenhouse gas footprint, the timing of vehicles becoming primarily connected and devices are internet of things, the timing of the ownership model changing and people may be less interested in personal ownership but maybe ride sharing or even relying on ride hailing completely. All of that hitting a, a peak you know, within, within the next 10 years or so. So I, I think that is cause for a rapid disruption in personal mobility, and obviously, you know, our business is about personal mobility. Mm -hmm. that, so that's, uh, it's interesting that it's a combination. I don't really, I, you think of them individually, but you don't think of them all kind of hitting that strike point at the same time necessarily. But I think that, uh, it, it's interesting then, would you say that there's like a perspective where you're on your heels? Is it a reactionary thing when you're thinking about mobility services and you're talking about um, you know, shared fleets and things like that. Because there's, I think there's a distinction between, you know, this is something we've been thinking about and planning for for a long time, and then there's this other perspective that people could see and interpret it as, wait a second, ownership is way, way down and only going to go down further. We need to scramble to figure out what to do to replace that. How much of it is one and how much of it is the other? Well, um... I think it's certainly things that we've been working on for a long, long time, but the pace at which the technology is advancing is faster than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that because it's becoming more readily apparent to the broader public and to the industry and, and new entrants out in Silicon Valley, et cetera, there's a lot more players coming into it, yeah. which factors into it. Um, I think on the usership side, you know, certainly the, the popularity of the, of the ride hailing model and ride sharing models um, is, is increasing, yet the aspect of personal ownership is still really, really high. You know, we're, we're at a record industry of sales right now. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, we'll, I think we'll see a distribution change happen over time, but I think that part of it will be gradual, yet this industry operates on pretty long cycles, so we need to be planning for that right now. Right, and that, that's an interesting thing too. So I think that there was a lot of uh, hype around car, ma car makers you know, coming up against some of these Silicon Valley companies, and are they going to compete? Are they going to be able to compete with the nimble new Silicon Valley companies? But the thing that car makers do 
perhaps better than any technology company is think on these longer 10 year cycles or whatever. So, so how important is that, do you think, to a, a category like autonomy? Well, I, I think it's um, really important. Um, I mean, autonomy is, is a, a form of technology, it's a form of automation, mm. right? And we're now applying automation to an area that we didn't think we'd be able to automate out of, which is the actual driver. Yeah. Um, it's not too different than, than factory automation. It's going to make sense to deploy that really expensive robot uh, in a business where you're paying a lot for labor in any cost structure, which is why you know, personal use of autonomous vehicles will come, but probably before that, it'll be introduced into businesses where they're paying a lot for driver labor. Yeah. And certainly, you know, the taxi or ride hailing business is one of those, commercial goods delivery is another one of those. But if you think of, you know, ride hailing um, as the total, total value stream in the total business, transportation as a service is at the top, right? So that's the Uber and the Lyfts of the world that, that actually connect a, a customer to a transportation solution. Um, the vehicles in the middle, let's, we'll break that up into three parts a little bit later. And down at the bottom, we're talking about how do you manage these fleets of vehicles? Because now you're, you're talking about a fleet that's not individually owned by an Uber driver or a right. Lyft driver. It's got to be owned and maintained and serviced by an entity. Yeah. And then on the vehicle side, the, the technical solution autonomy, particularly the virtual driver system, is just one portion. Um, we have a portion of what we call the autonomous vehicle platform, which is the base changes that have to happen in the rest of the vehicle for it to work like an autonomous vehicle. So multiple safety backup systems have to be in place for an autonomous vehicle because in many cases, like for your power steering, the backup for a, a power steering failure is human muscle, right. right? Well, now there's no human muscle to apply to a steering wheel. And then finally, as I said, it's, it's a very high scale industry that relies on economies of scale. So it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of vehicles or components that need to be you know, manufactured and, and engineered and designed and importantly be able to be produced at scale. And, and so that, those three aspects of the vehicle side are really critical. And so to make sense of that as a total business, you have to have all five of those elements right. right. And I think a fair portion of those elements we've got quite a bit of experience in. Um, it's skill sets that are hard to reproduce. Yeah. And then we're obviously investing in uh, the engineering on the virtual driver system and the engineering on the autonomous vehicle platform, but also experimenting in vehicle management services as well as transportation as a service. So I think whoever gets the use case right and gets all five of those elements right is probably going to be the one that, that's going to be able to take advantage of autonomy as a business. And Ford seems interested in doing that itself. Like you mentioned that the 12, uh, 12 years of experience you guys have building autonomy, but you also just acquired the majority stake in Argo AI not too long ago, right? And that's relatively young talent, I guess, mm -hmm. to the field compared to that 12 years of experience. So what's the discrepancy there? Like where do you choose to go out and acquire and bring in new? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first of all, we're, we're always open to partnerships, so I wouldn't say we're oh, okay. intent on just doing it ourselves. Um, it depends on which area of the autonomy solution or this, this total personal mobility solution that we're looking at. So, um, you know, it can be a wholly acquired entity like Sipes, which is a, a software company in Israel that we, yep. we acquired. Um, it can be something like Velodyne on the LiDAR, where we, we have an investment with Velodyne and they're great partners with us, but we're also open to other LiDAR partnerships. Um, it can be licensing agreements that we have with like Nirenberg Neuroscience. Um, and Argo AI, I think, is a, a very interesting hybrid model. So probably the, the most sought after talent right now in the autonomous space is, is the roboticists, is the, the software experts, the machine learning experts, those guys working that virtual driver system. And we've got a very strong in team internally, but um, you know, to be honest, they were being heavily recruited. Yeah. Um, we saw an opportunity with Argo AI, particularly with, with two experienced leaders, with Brian Seleski and Pete Rander, that we knew quite well and were really interested in, in that opportunity. Um, we saw an opportunity to provide stable funding for that startup, and so a billion dollars over five years that was consistent with what we thought we would be spending in that area. Right. We were able to actually move our Ford engineers, our virtual driver system engineers, into Argo AI, 
So providing them a startup structure, including equity upside, oh, that would be very different than Ford Motor Company stock yeah. equity upside, uh, because our core business is going to drive our, our stock, um, like the F-150 or sales of the Mustang, et cetera. And so this hybrid art, uh, structure of a startup with its funding over the next five years, basically firm, um, with a built-in customer, um, with a bunch of automotive experience now put into this startup, understanding exactly how Ford Motor Company works and how our products work and how that integration is going to need to happen. Yet, um, with all the experience coming from outside um, and attracting a lot of new talent, we think it's a great, great model. So. Um, I wouldn't say we're intent on doing everything internally, but we are intent on making sure the partnerships that we pick and, and however we choose to structure that fits into that overall strategy. And we really look at it on a much more strategic aspect than perhaps some of the, the tactical aspects of, of responding and trying to make a headline, per se. Right. So if, uh, if you're open to partnerships, are you open to a partnership like with Waymo, perhaps? I mean, have you guys spoken to them at all? Yeah, we, we, we talked to everybody. <laughs> um, and, and I think if it was the, you know, the right partnership where it's, it's really a win-win, we'd always be open to that, yeah. I think. Um, Same goes for Lyft then, maybe? Or? Sure. Um, you know, again, if you break that down into the, the five areas that I talked about, transportation as a service, virtual driver system, autonomous vehicle platform, ability to go into mass production, and then managing fleets, vehicle management as a service, um, you know, certainly Waymo is, is in a strong position on that virtual driver system. Um, Lyft is in a, a strong position on transportation as a service, but again, we'll need the all five elements for all of this to work. And if it's a win-win and, and in allowing us to participate in, you know, revenue across that stream and, and the multiples we would expect and the operating margins we would expect on that type of business, we'd certainly be open to discussion. Great. I think uh, we don't have that much time, but I want to talk briefly about 2021 since it's coming up real quick, and that's still your stated goal, right, for delivering. Yeah. Uh, so that hasn't changed, no news yet. <laughs> no, no news there. It's still our intent uh, to offer a SAE level four autonomous vehicle, so a vehicle with no steering wheel, no accelerator pedal, uh, no brake pedal that'll be operating in a geofenced area, um, but a, a large you know, metropolitan geofenced area, and likely in uh, ride hailing or commercial goods. Some kind of commercial. They're starting stuff. in 2021, yeah. So, and wh wh who owns the sort of fleet in that? You mentioned that too when you were talking about the stack. Like, who is the owner of that? Because I think, I think we've heard maybe that you're working kind of directly with municipalities or with cities on maybe purchasing these fleets and operating them, similar to how you might work a public transit. Yeah, I think we're right now we're experimenting in a, in a, a couple of different forms of that. Uh, part of it is the chariot. Um, experiment that we're doing where we're owning you know fleets of transits running shuttles and working municipalities on on some aspects of dynamic shuttle and dynamic routing but also fixed routes at a smaller scale um, and and other city as customer pilots i i think we're open to ownership of that fleet you're um, you are open to owning it we're or, open to different models okay. yeah we're, we're open to different discussions of different models as to where that ownership of that fleet would reside we're obviously very interested in participating in that. We're interested in, in managing those vehicles as a service. We're obviously interested in, in, in manufacturing those vehicles. Uh, and we'd also be interested in you know, the, the profit opportunity, the revenue opportunity on the customer facing side on what would be paid for for personal mobility, transportation as a service, maybe even in a, a multimodal aspect where that autonomous ride hailing vehicle is just one mode of a person's journey. Huh. So I think we're open to a lot of those aspects, which is why we have Ford Smart Mobility set up and is able to experiment now early on as we see this future coming, coming to us. That was, that was another question, actually. You've got Chariot and you've got Ford Smart Mobility, and, and is that really, do you see that as becoming sort of core product sooner rather than later, or is it still kind of side bets and experiments and testing stuff out? Well, I think right now it's, it's an investment into learning, and, and it's going to be a while before we see you know, big revenues from that that model, um, but we're fortunate that our, our core business is very healthy right now. Um, you know, we're coming off of you know, close to record profits last year, so that core business of selling cars, utilities, and trucks we're going to continue to invest in and continue to focus on. It's a big enabler for us to move into these emerging opportunities and leverage that. Um, but right now, this investment in the emerging opportunities is, is definitely an investment into the future and revenue opportunities that will come to us in the future. 
So no name change to Ford Technology Company. Anything no, I think we're going to be called Ford Motor Company for a while. The company's uh, attached to it. The family's attached to it. <laughs> um, but uh, I think Ford Motor Company is going to look very differently. You know, ten years from now, it's going to be. Um, I think no, not just as an automotive company, but an automotive and mobility company. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, Rash. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right.